Right, I would like to contribute a few philosophical thoughts, quite different in terms of both form and content from what we've just heard, on the question of whether there is a kind of ethical dimension to internet technology, or perhaps we could put this in rather more general terms, information technology of the kind that we have. And I will be very philosophical about it. Whenever Dr. Mavelia holds a conference, it's very interdisciplinary with different perspectives on the subject matter. So please expect this to be a little philosophical. I assume that many of you are so familiar with the technological background that we don't have to say very much about that. We could go into more detail in the discussion, and I'm sure there will be a lot of controversial matter here. I've broken it down into three parts. Firstly, the question, what changes through the new information technologies, specifically the Internet? Then in the second part, the ethical aspects to those changes, and a third part, a rather generous framework of political ethics, what political dimensions do we need to consider? Those two things are closely related, so they can't really be separated in a clear-cut way. I'd like to begin with perhaps some rather provocative statements about what the net or the web has changed. One could say that from the outset, and that's not typical for this technology, but it applies to any technology, as far back as we can look, there are two characteristic and contrary reactions to new technologies. To exaggerate a little, one could say there's the euphoric camp on the one side and the apocalyptic camp on the other. You get a new technology, it arouses fears among those who are concerned that they're losing something familiar, and it arouses hopes for another world, a much better world, among the euphoric-minded. Both of them are hysterical reactions in some way, and I'm going to try to come up with a, an objective golden middle and suggest that both are wrong as we look back over centuries of technological development. I think we can conclude that. I would like to raise the issue of one use of language which was originally used ironically, but I think has now become a serious concept, and that is the distinction that is often made between digital natives and digital immigrants. And all young parents who have children know what I'm talking about, or teachers who have the wonderful task in the name of ministers of culture and education to, of introducing the new technology and often frustrated as they observe that their pupils often know more about it than they do or to wash our dirty linen in public, perhaps the IT departments of big universities that would collapse if they didn't have the students to help them and explain things to them. So to some extent, there's some truth to it. Some people grow up with the technology, others have to learn it and take great pains to do so. But the distinction is fundamentally wrong. It's so wrong that it's amazing that the image has been retained for such a long time. Sooner or later, of course, these technologies have to have taken root. Who did that then? Shall we call them the digital pioneers? Those are the ones who, along with Atari and so forth, and all those big battles at the beginning. I remember when I was at the Geschwister Scholl Institute as a student and I was spokesperson for the students in the 80s and I suggested to the manager of the department that there should be a computer in every department and there was scornful laughter. Why on earth would we need so many computers? Surely one per institute would be enough. So those were the battles we had to fight at the outset with permanent fights going on. Of course, things are much more developed now to introduce these new technologies and the gradual changes in academic communication. After all, this was the predecessor. The academic world was the first after the military, because the military invented the internet, we shouldn't forget that, 
in order to ensure that they had second strike capability. That was the background motive for developing internet technology. Very often these are the same people who have a problem keeping up with the state of the art, but they were the ones who introduced it and asserted its right to be there. So we have these two opposite camps, the apocalyptic and euphoric camp, but there is also a philosophical dimension to this. I'm going to talk a little about technicist ideology, which says more or less, depending on what technology we use, that will lead to a completely new formation of human life, the way we live as humans. Technology determines our lifestyle as human beings. Now, if you look at that closely, there's a Marxist origin to that thesis. Because what is the driving force of history for Marx? Technology. Well, to be precise, the forces of production. The forces of production affect nature. They turn natural forces into commodities. And this impact has an inherent dynamism. It's not historically additive, accumulative. It's the core is the technology itself. That's where the mystification comes in, in Marxist thinking. Those forces drive themselves forward and therefore are the actual driving force of all history. That's the Marxist core of this theory. The relations of production, on the other hand, are more stable, more resistant to change. They take on those means of production, use them in the form that suits them, but then the inherent dynamism of the means of production eventually lead to the collapse of those forces of production and lead to a new relationship between social forces or new relationship of property which becomes established in the production of objects. And then sooner or later there will be a phase when the conflict starts to grow again between on the one hand the resistance of the forces of production and the dynamism of the means of production. Now, not all proponents of technicism are aware of the fact that they are a kind of subspecies of Marxist ideology. In a nutshell, I suppose, if you quote Kittler, this ideology says there is no such thing as the human condition. There is nothing that is sustained through the changes to the forces of production, but the conditions of human existence define what being human means. I just mentioned Hitler, of course, in his older years, he returned to Socrates and ancient Greek philosophy, which is a little bit ironical, really. But uh, that was possibly an attempt to address the nihilistic implications which that perspective implied. This technicist perspective is often associated with a radical idealist perspective, which means there is no such thing as the world in itself, which is a thesis the realists have. There is a world which is to some extent independent of those who observe the world, and develop theories about the world. The world is not the result of theories, purely and simply. It's quite possible that there is a neutral description of the world, but the world is not an epistemic condition or state. That's what the realists state. And the idealists say the world is an epistemic state. The world is simply a state of knowledge about who says what about it. And if you combine those two things, technicism and idealism, or what we normally call constructivism today, then we do indeed end up with a perspective according to which the inherent dynamism of technological development reinvents anything that is normative or makes the normative irrelevant.
I think that this technicist view is wrong, and I would like to illustrate that with some pragmatic points. Some people talk about the decline of the Gutenberg era as a result of the new information technologies. The concrete idea behind that is more or less the following. The era of Gutenberg begins when printing becomes possible. So you have illuminated manuscripts as a transition phase, and then you have the mass product of the book, which event originally was an elite product, but then becomes a mass product, especially if you're talking about something as important as the Bible. And the thesis is, this establishes a literate culture, which replaces the old picture-oriented culture. And this focus on the script shifts the logic of public discourse and enables the sciences to emerge. The end of the Gutenberg era is supposed to mean that we are currently going through a new shift back to the iconographic which puts the old written script-based culture behind it and with it the old forms of logic of communicative interaction. Those become obsolete. Now, there are a lot of bothersome aspects to that. The first bothersome aspect is that the history of science or of knowledge doesn't develop in accordance with those eras. There are certainly ruptures or shifts in the history of knowledge. There are reformations, but they are incredibly independent from those technological revolutions. The invention of the book changes almost nothing to begin with for science or for knowledge. It's easier to communicate, yes, and more knowledge is stored in books, and the effort that monks in monasteries had to undertake to copy manuscripts is no longer necessary. It's not as central as it used to be. But these are marginal changes, improvements to communications about knowledge, but the content of scientific exchange, as far as I can see, hardly changes at all. No, of course, we could cast more light on that, but I would say that a much more serious shift in era was the Italian early Renaissance with its rediscovery of the ancient texts, the ancient thinkers. That brings a shift in cultural thinking, whereas the invention of the printed book doesn't have much impact. And the same really applies to the big industrial changes in communication. The potential of internet communication, as far as we can see, there's no evidence that it has really affected the way to develop our rationales, the way we understand the logic of scientific thinking. And I think there, there's been a lot of exaggeration. Of course, there are effects of the internet on specific scientific exchange and practice. In the rather perverse form of company presentations and so forth, and demands that industry makes of education, this thesis of a change in our culture due to the internet takes such form that we now believe we live in a knowledge society, whereas we didn't before. And the world of education needs now to adapt to this new knowledge society. It's an interesting concept. For the last 2,500 years, philosophy has had a lot to say about the concept of knowledge. And if you bear that all in mind, then one has to vehemently refute this characterization. What is more appropriate would be the concept of data society, or if you like, information society. Data society, information society, but not knowledge society. Knowledge is perhaps one of the concepts that has been most 
heftily debated by philosophers. And if we look at the substance since the Thyatetus dialogue of Plato, we look back at that, and really, in substance, that is pretty much unchanged for many centuries, although Gettier added to it in the last century. Knowledge is certainly not a conviction that concurs with reality. If one of you can tell me which numbers are going to come up in the next lottery, and I respond by saying, you can't know that, then this objection, you can't know that, if you claim that you know what the next numbers are going to be, my assertion is still correct, even if those numbers do come up. If anything, any other opinion would have to be esoteric. The idea that you can predict lottery numbers, or to go back to the Tito's dialogue, Nobody can have good reason for the belief that these are going to be the numbers that come up in the next lottery. There is no possibility, there is no good rational reason for the belief that I know what the numbers are that are going to come up in the next lottery. And if that's the fact, then it doesn't really matter if those numbers come up, because that person couldn't know it, or in other words... Knowledge is not simply a true opinion, and this comes back to the Theotitos dialogue. Knowledge is well-founded, and I'm saying objectively well-reasoned. We can argue what that means. Objectively well-reasoned, true opinion, with a qualification that unfortunately has been necessary ever since Gettier showed that these two conditions are not enough to talk of knowledge. I'll give you an example later. This qualification has to be factored in, and the debate is not yet over about how this should be accurately formulated, even though that text was written several decades ago. I'm not going to give you Gettier's example, but perhaps a more accessible example. Assuming that you are on a Greek island, and you want to travel back to the mainland so that you can fly home and the shipping schedules are that reliable, at least in terms of the times. They tend to be more unreliable than reliable, to stick with the cliché. So you stay at the window of your boarding house and you look down at the port before you pack your bags to see whether the ship is actually in sight or is it going to be four hours late or perhaps not come at all. And you look out and you can see a, a ship which is about 20 minutes away from, about 20 minutes before the ship is due to leave, you see a ship in the port, so you say, wonderful, you pack your bags, you get onto your ship, you go back to the mainland. Obviously, you knew the ship was coming because you saw the ship coming and you were right, the ship did come, it was on time. And then it turns out afterwards that you got onto the right ship, you left at the right time, the ship arrived at the right time, all that is true. But unfortunately, the ship that you saw 20 minutes ago, or 20 minutes earlier, was not this ship, it was a different ship. The problem with that example is you had good reason, because not many ships approach the island, so you had a good reason to assume that this was the ship that you were waiting for. Objectively, you had good reason. I think you can try to address that with probability theory. The chance of it being a different ship was negligible. So you were right. Or you were right, because you had a true opinion, but something isn't Correct. And what isn't correct, that debate isn't over yet. A lot would say, apart from that, there has to be an appropriate causal nexus between the thing that gives me the reason, or the good grounds for believing, and the fact that I have a belief about. That is the causal link in this problem. But there are other explanations for the problem. That's knowledge. And of course, it seems to be just a philosophical question, is this an adequate concept of knowledge? Basically, I think we can't doubt it, but it is certainly very relevant to our issue here. Mere data, 
do not yet constitute knowledge. Knowledge or data becomes knowledge only through this detour that there has to be a belief based on good grounds, as I described. In other words, in a society which certainly is different from an early society in the sense that one characteristic is that data can be acquired at almost zero cost, quite apart from the time taken to search and the energy that is used for the search. But on the whole, data can be acquired at absolutely near zero cost, a huge quantity of data. And let's say in ideal terms, this data is available to everybody, ipso facto, that is not yet a knowledge society, it's a data or information society. It only becomes a knowledge society if the inferred relationships, the justifying relationships between hypotheses and convictions or beliefs are constructed in such a way that the individual has good reason for a belief which is also true. There's an economic paradox here which is actually not insignificant. It sounds quite trivial, in fact, and all economic historians are well familiar with it. It's the fact that, for example, with the steam engine and other technical apparatus, there was an explosion, I suppose you could say, in productivity in the early industrialization period in Europe. And that massively shifted the weight played by different sectors of the economy. In the feudal age, in the Middle Ages and the early modern age, over 90% were of people were producing basic needs. They were catering for basic needs, food, housing, clothing. As the beginnings of industrialization meant that mass products could be in, made in huge numbers with rather less input, those sectors of the economy where huge input had been required to produce those things became relatively less important in the economy as a whole. If we have two sectors and in one sector you have a huge gain in productivity and the other less progress in productivity, then to put it very crudely, and I know this is a bit problematic, there are two possibilities. Either the less productive sector disappears or the importance of that sector increases because the sector where the gain in productivity is great, the input for producing these goods becomes less, it becomes cheaper and cheaper. Innovation technologies in recent decades have proved that again and again. This rapid devaluation of hardware because of technical progress is one example. And the monetary devaluation, which is so rapid of those products, is an example. So we can generalize a little and say the fact that data is now so easily retrievable or so accessible and in such a huge quantity, data lose value. This is a challenge for the education system because you could say our entire education system is pretty lethargic when it comes to adjusting to new challenges. It reflects a period when the availability of data was much poorer. So the retrievability of facts was much more important. This is still reflected in the education system and so there's a lot of ballast still. Whereas the questions about rationale, about reasoning, about the rationale for knowledge has become more important. 
And there again, there is a philosophical dimension to that. How do we know? That's the way the question is normally put. This is the question we normally put to realists. How do we know what a true opinion is? And the answer is, well, really, we never know. That is, every rationale, every reasoning is always hypothetical. Or to put it another way, reasonable realists should also be fallibilists and never certists. They should always assume that even if a view is really well reasoned, it might be wrong. If I combine realism with certism, I'm getting into hot water, which the philosophy in Europe in the last 300 years and across the world has torn its hair out about. Where is the thing that medieval philosophers called the unshakable foundation on which all, or from which all knowledge can be derived? With Descartes, we start to get some ideas, this cogito, but also benevolent God. These are all foundations on which everything has to be built. The logical empiricists say, yes, of course, these are sensual perceptions, others say these are protocol statements. I say, this is all bullshit. None of these fundamentalist, or foundationalist, I should call it, rather than fundamentalist, the way it's used today, none of these foundationalist concepts, which philosophy and the theory of knowledge have addressed for the last 300 years, have really stood the test. That is, even the best-founded beliefs can be wrong. We have to remain fallibilistic. There is no criterion which can tell me in a clear-cut way what is true and what is wrong. So we need judgment. And this judgment isn't just an individual phenomenon. I've been concerned again and again with the question of what distinguishes individuals around this particular skill or ability. It's a question which still concerns me and which I can't really answer. I'd like to give you a few negative answers, the way I see it. Of course it's got something to do with intelligence, but intelligence itself is not a basis for judgment. There are highly intelligent people who obviously suffer from a dramatic lack of judgment. You can see that because every few weeks they're quite capable of changing their opinions. It relates to education, but not so closely that that can be an adequate criterion. Educated can mean if I have certain skills in developing arguments, I have read the theories, I have tested my thinking in certain spheres, especially in formal education. In a lot of cases it helps, but it's certainly not enough to be sure of having an ability to form a judgment. So, fostering judgment, I would say, is the central aim of education. Not knowledge or facts, not collecting data, but exercising judgment. And that means both individually, but crucially, collectively. And there are problems there. We have to be able to deliberate. We have to be able to weigh up reasons. Deliberation is the technical term. And this has been hugely revalued, upgraded, because there are now there is now such so much data available. Just a comment on that difference between individual and collective. What is common knowledge? A trivial form of common knowledge is seven people for whom applies that each of these seven people knows that P, which means strictly that they believe firmly that P is the case, P is true, and they have good reasons for P. This is a simple form, a trivial form of common knowledge, but it's not the really interesting form. Let's take a second example. Seven people know how a particular piece of technical apparatus works. I can also say that if none of them 
knows how it works. But each of the seven knows how one aspect or of how it works or what has to be done in a particular situation to make that apparatus work. And all of them know who knows what. So there's a division of labor about knowing that apparatus. Nobody knows how a power station works or even something less complex. But there is a collective knowledge, in the best case, as to how it works. And the common knowledge is not that everyone knows P, but that everyone knows something of P, and the composition of that partial knowledge is pretty comprehensive, and that's the first condition, but B, the second condition, Everyone needs to know what the others know. Without that replication, as David Lewis calls it, without that replication, we don't have common knowledge. I would even go so far as to say that if seven people all know that P, they don't have common knowledge of P. Only when A, all of them know P, and B, you know that I know that P, and I know that you know that P, and so forth. Without replications, there is no common knowledge. And you could imagine how complex this becomes when you analyze it more closely, because we have skill gaps. If two people don't agree on what their skill gap is, and each thinks they are more competent than the other, then they're going to have problems developing common knowledge. If they recognize one another with this skills gap, and there are certain processes for doing that, then processes of communication and deliberation can be set in motion to improve the common knowledge of these two people. What Plato calls this sophrosyne, by the way, the third of the cardinal virtues, and I think that's what Plato is referring to with sophrosyne. And a modern mathematical theoretician Keith Lehrer talks about, uses probability instruments to analyze this experiment. And there are some follow-up studies to that. And you can think quite carefully about how this dynamism in knowledge can be set in motion and what conditions there are to it. And it's not such a trivial matter. It seems to me that this dynamic under the conditions of modern information technologies are more challenged than ever before. And why? Because in previous centuries, there were a number of institutions that developed as gatekeepers, sometimes in processes that took decades or centuries, sometimes bloody conflicts. To give you an example, one important gatekeeping function was exercised by the Catholic clergy. Catholic clergy at the time, Catholos, of course, was all-encompassing, and you can talk about the Catholic clergy as being Catholic before there was a split with Protestantism. So this clergy claimed to have to hold the last criterion, to be able to formulate the very last benchmark for what was admissible knowledge. And if there was any doubt, it came to the accusation of heresy. And that is a very bloody trail left through the history of the Christian church in Europe. Galileo, for example, Giordano Bruno, Abelard, there's a long list. The decisive thing, and this is a constituent condition of the modern age, that this gatekeeping function was torn down ultimately in a pretty harsh manner. Thomas Hobbes, for example, puts it this way. The churches should look after their business, the state should look after its affairs, commerce and science will thrive if there is an order of peace and the powers of coercion are 
in one sovereign hand. If the churches interfere, then these things are at risk. The churches didn't like that, and Thomas Hobbes spent his life on the run because he was pursued for secular reasons and for ecclesiastical reasons, and it's quite irony that this man who was born during the terrors of the Thirty Years' War, the war between the denominations in Europe, he said, fear and, 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 and terror were my midwife. He lived to the age of over 90 and remained productive until his elderly years. And there's a similar focus thesis to Frank Schirmacher, who died recently, many others, Plato and Socrates, which he managed to refute the idea that people in the old days become much older than 40. So gatekeeping. And one of the arguments in the euphoric camp, when the internet age began, was at last we've got rid of gatekeeping. At last there is nobody left who can in any way preform what the public consciousness is allowed to become aware of, what we think about, and so forth. Everyone, every individual can now take part in this great game of developing an opinion on an equal basis, all of us as peers, all with e an equal ability to influence processes. Of course, it was clear from the beginning that this had to be a major illusion, if only for purely mathematical reasons, if you consider what the possible number of possible interactions of possible participants in the discourse are, there are such huge numbers that such chaotic communication of this kind cannot work. And as a result of that, what developed was something that was mathematically to be expected, that there were partial discourses, partial public discourses with partial AT partial rules. If you look at a big project like Wikipedia, it has a normative constitution, there are normative rules about how people communicate, how they're supposed to produce evidence, but very much with a realistic spirit behind it, almost a character of a realistic spirit, because there always seemed to be the idea that is a finding which evidence will prove or not, but there are new forms of structuring of communication which emerge. No objection to that, of course. And in recent years, something that people have become increasingly aware of is that these new forms of structuring and of gatekeeping have been increasingly impregnated by commercial interests. The algorithms that the Google search engines use are not just committed to a search for truth, but there are also commercial interests behind them. The various functions which a smartphone has these days and which are very difficult to ignore are naturally also driven by commercial interests. The NSA scandal which is interesting in this respect in that it counters the image that for many that was associated with the internet for many years is that we live in a world where everyone can decide for themselves how much of their beliefs, their relations with others is exposed, is made public. And in a world like this, we are all responsible for ourselves and everything is wonderful. The NSA scandal, or the fact that this massive control of functions has been influenced by the American Secret Service with billions of dollars behind them, the fact that that led to such a huge outcry illustrates the fact that there was an illusion accompanying our ideas of new web-based communication. The illusion that this form of self-monitoring is enough to prevent abuse. I was strangely touched by the fact that this whole debate about WikiLeaks, Assange, and now, of course, related to that Snowden, but this original scandal, 
began with the fact that things that were secret suddenly became, became public. And the critics interpreted this as showing that the protective function of secrecy, of privacy, was in danger, but I think that was only a pretext. What WikiLeaks really showed is that we don't live in a world where democracy is not realized according to certain constituent factors that are important to it. In Perpetual Peace, Immanuel Kant said in 1795 that the central criterion for a world a league of peace was the publicity of the state. Not the publicity of the individual, but the publicity of the state. Publicity means no state may conclude secret treaties with another state. The idea of democratic peace, which 200 years later turned out to be empirically true, because Doyle analyzed it and nobody has refuted his work to date, does not say that the democracies and republics never wage war, but that democracies and republics never wage war against each other. And the argument which we find the seeds of in 1795 in the Perpetual Peace by Kant, and we have to be a little bit more, flesh that out a bit, is that democracies are born by a certain ethos. And this ethos implies that the governments, on behalf of their citizenship as a whole, act on behalf of their citizenship as a whole, and therefore they are subordinate to this criterion of publicity. That is, everything must be available to everyone for their judgment. And under conditions like that, it's difficult to wage a war against a democracy or a republic. I'm going to use those interchangeably, although they ought to be distinguished as concepts, at least for our purposes, that that's perfectly acceptable not to distinguish clearly between democracy and republic, because then one has to justify why another state, which is also subject to the pr principle of publicity, but also the principle of the autonomy of the individual, because that is the basis of the contractus originarius, which we also find in Immanuel Kant as a constituent factor of democracy, so that in a republican system, public consensus, public debate is an integral factor. So if one threatens to kill in citizens of another state, even though we have a common ethos as to how to make decisions, which is based on the principle of autonomy and publicity criteria, in a nutshell, that is the justification for the theory of democratic peace. This strange phenomenon, which realism, which was dominated by it for a long time, uh, now it's not so dominated by it. We have a completely different realism in international relations. It's the thesis that the international order is a natural state where every state pursues its own interests and doesn't take any moral or cultural account of anything else. This has now been reputed, this Kantian perpetual peace. Back to WikiLeaks. What WikiLeaks demonstrated was that the publicity criterion is de facto not being met, and that is the true scandal. Perhaps they were a bit clumsy about it, but that's the real scandal, the interesting scandal. If you read the dispatches, what turns out is that the public were not occasionally, but many times over, systematically misled. Dispatches between US embassies in Arab countries which say there is a big interest in, for example, Iran being confronted with military options and intimidated or deterred. This is an interest that our Arabic friends like Saudi Arabia propose, but at the same time, officially, at congresses in the Middle East, for example, the complete opposite was being said. And the 
US administration was stating the complete opposite. And amongst other things, regularly supported the idea of working together with Turkey, letting it join the EU, although the Turkish ambassador was saying that Turkey was on the way to becoming an Islamic state. So that is the true scandal. The criterion of publicity in foreign policies, at least of the EU, US, and comparable in France and in UK and also in Germany, this criterion is not being met. And with that, of course, democratic peace is threatened. And Assange has got a very interesting background. Assange emerged, together with many of his fellows, from a movement that in the past, in the times of their origins, called themselves crypto-anarchists. That was a movement that uh, by no means was comprised of secret anarchists, you could misunderstand it that way, but that was rather a movement that did not want internet communication to be read. And that's why they used means of cryptography, and it's become very current as an issue indeed, all these different forms of encryption, in order to avoid that internet communication becomes public. So what conclusions can we draw from that? Well, one conclusion is that the uh, idea spread in the cultural pages of the newspapers that we all got used to, that the ethics of the internet, the ethics of the information technologies, that is, the presumed readiness to all-encompassing transparency and the dissolution between of the differentiation between the private and the public is just a chimera. This is by no means the case. The vanguard of internet activists wanted quite the opposite. They wanted to avoid that private communications could be read by large corporations or governments and their intelligence services. The idea that uh, the internet is a technology that would make the old differentiation between the public and the private sphere obsolete, this brave new world where everyone would make their most private thoughts public is just an erroneous idea. It's a chimera. It does not correspond to reality. And this leads us over to the question of what kind of ethical and political conclusions arise out of this. I would like to uh, now talk about three ethical aspects. The first one, I don't need to really talk too much about that, is that of inclusion. Democratic societies live based on the idea of inclusion, and in my eyes no one really formulated that idea better than John Dewey in Democracy and Education. He formulated the idea that the education that is offered by the state needs to be of the type that allows everyone to participate in all questions and discourses that are relevant to democracy, that they can participate and form their own opinion. And uh, this also applies to the sciences. They need to be formulated in a way that is understandable. So the first requirement is inclusion. Otherwise, democracy just cannot work. A couple of years ago, at a congress, I argued in favor of the idea of access to the internet being a human right. Not because this has always been part of the code of human rights, even latently, but rather in the sense that some for example, social minimal standards have now become a human right because the exclusion from these individual rights would actually exclude the affected individuals from the community. And access to the Internet depends on a cultural empirical question, and that is what role the Internet plays. If that role in many parts of the world has um, developed so far that it is a precondition for participation in essential communication and interactive processes, 
then, of course, this form of participation becomes a human right. The theorem of a digital gap that was so appealing for quite some time is no longer being advocated as such because the development is rather clear. And that means that even in the poorer regions of the world, communication via the Internet is spreading rapidly. And it's probably only a question of years until this access with very few exceptions, will be relatively inclusive in nature. The second ethical aspect. There are three largely undisputed, or let's say that two largely undisputed constituent conditions for successful communication. This was not formulated by moralists, but by rather well-grounded analytical philosophers, with a theoretical and a semantic arguments, the intentionalist semantic Christ Lewis Bennett, especially David Lewis, uh, made a major contribution with an essay he wrote towards the end of the 70s, Language and Languages, and uh, he before that wrote the book Convention. And he said that the meaning of terms that we are using in communication are not stable, or would not be stable, if two basic conditions um, were not met, that is, on the one hand, truthfulness, and on the other hand, trust. And this means that if people state something, they are convinced that it is true. It does not necessarily mean that it is true, but if I hear someone making a statement, making a claim, then I assume that the person making that claim is actually convinced that it is true, so that is trust. If these two conditions are systematically violated, then uh, a lot more happens than just, uh, you know, a sense of irritation that people would become vexed or anything. But then, you know, the meaning of the terms being used can no longer be kept stable. And the meaning would change along with the communicative acts. And in that respect, we always have to be clear about the fact that uh, using ironic language is very parasitic in a very concrete way. It does work, but only if the lion's share of uh, communication is not ironic. If the lion's share of communication were to be ironic, then irony wouldn't work any longer. Or a very old argument of Immanuel Kant, if people would... Uh, give uh, promises that they lie about, then in the end the institution of the promise would no longer work. It's not just that people would believe each other any longer. The institution of the promises would no longer work. So two conditions. Then there is the third condition, that is how well-based statements concerning the world are based in reality. You can also look at imperatives and standards and norms in this context, but I won't do that. But these three postulates are by no means to be taken as natural. Many people do not stick to these rules. The question as to under which communicative conditions the likelihood of people breaching these rules or adhering to them changes. And we can say a few things about that. The higher the level of density of uh, communicative interaction, the more face-to-face -face communication is taking place, the more exact my knowledge is about who is the source of a specific opinion or statement, and the more feedback is possible between persons, this may be very complex because many, many people may be involved in this communication, the higher the likelihood that there is an interest in cooperation and communication by sticking to these three rules. So this is a general principle. Wherever social interaction has a high level of density, and the higher this level of density, the more convergence between your own interest and adhering to the rules, or adherence to the rules. And that is why the states and the penal law is relatively uh, shy to intervene in these fields. Wherever social interactions have a high level of density, the higher the level of density, the more likely there will be a convergence between your interests and adherence to the rules. And that is why the state, the government, and the penal law is rather reluctant to intervene in these areas. Wherever the interactions become more fragile, more sketchy, wherever the origins or the sources 
are no longer known, the easier these principles can be eroded or just dissolve completely. And then there is a third aspect. This concerns the communications communicative acts that are being embedded. This now sounds a little bit like uh, Habermas. I quite frequently do not agree with Habermas, but this time I do. But if they're embedded into larger strategic projects, as for example the strategic project of uh, getting more votes in the next general election, the instrumentalization of communication then leads to an erosion of its constituent preconditions. A part of uh, the debates in the federal parliament no longer constitute real communication, it's something else. You get to know about the interests of the individual parties. And of course, gratefully, uh, thankfully, this is not uh, always the case, and there are also serious discussions taking place there, but quite frequently it is. So these are the threats to the principles that actually allow for successful communication. Now the question whether these things are also true and valid for Internet technologies and uh, to which extent. But I think that we have to take a very differentiated look at these things, you know, the simple technophobic a position that is close to apocalyptic thinking says that um, with the internet all the preconditions for the high conformity with these three basic rules actually is no longer given but this argumentation is not valid look at the social media not all of the aspects of social media but one aspect of social media actually is that people there at least to a large extent show themselves with their real names with uh, their biographic information that may be brushed up, but they can be contacted, there can be a form of feedback. There is a form of face-to-face -face communication, albeit mediated through the internet. In many fora, this is no longer the case. I don't know who I'm talking to, I don't know whether they're male or female. I don't know what kind of interests individual slurs or forms of abuse should serve. I don't know how to defend myself against these slurs. And here, quite frequently, the anonymous nature of communication and the lack of face-to-face -face communication, the sketchiness of interaction, leads to a dissolution of the constituent conditions for successful communication. That means that real communication erodes and does no longer take place. Typically, those who are being affected by abuse, for example, react by just stopping their communication. You just accept abuse the one time, but not twice. And that is where people discontinue communications. So I'd say it's rather ambivalent. Internet technology is ambivalent with a view to this question. There are particular forms of uh, communication being formed. New ethics arise that in part are very precisely um, drafted and are in flux. I just mentioned the Wikipedia, which has a rather explicit set of ethical rules, but in many different communities there are their own ethics that are being created for that communication. And this you know, struggle for the content of ethics in the respective communication situations shows two things. On the one hand, how important ethics is for communication, and that many, if not most, of the participants of Internet communication actually have an interest in keeping communication functional, that it would not mutate into something else that doesn't have anything to do with communication any longer. And now, to the ends of my presentation, I would like to mention at least a couple of political aspects uh, like that of the theory of democracy. Try to understand the following. Just take the four most important paradigms of democracy. The first paradigm would be that of a collectively acting agent that is legitimized by the vote of the majority. That is democracy, to have a collective agent. The second is what in Germany is connected to the name of Habermas, in the US it's more linked to the name of Henry R. Richardson and others. The concept of democracy as a forum or as an agora, you know, as a platform, if you will, a forum where different projects can be introduced and arguments can be exchanged, then there is discussion about that also through the media, and towards the end, people form their opinion that then carries democracy. And of course, the precondition is that there is this kind of forum that is available to a large majority of people. Thirdly, 
a community. This has always been the communitarian counter movement, even before the term was coined by Hegel and others, for example, saying, no, no, that the true foundation of all politics, Hegel does not talk about democracy, of course, is that of forming communities that last over time and that represent or create certain values or, you know, the more a person just think of contemporary Hegelians like Charles Taylor. So, interests are weighed against each other, are being negotiated. Lobbies are, of course, uh, legitimate, even necessary in this respect for negotiating with these ideas. And then in the end, there would be a compromise. What else could democracy be? And um, in the end, you can then take a vote every four or five years as to whether the whole direction of the bargaining process is the right one or not, or whether it should be replaced by a different mode of action. So, just take those four paradigms, the collective agents, the forum, community, and the market. These are four paradigms of democracy. And uh, one could say that the internet communication, the new information technologies, are very well compatible with the last uh, mentioned item, the bargaining model. I think with all the possibilities of communicating, of exchanging information, to form an opinion, even in partial public spheres, this bargaining process has become more differentiated. More and more voices can be heard that before wouldn't really have had the opportunity to make themselves heard. Yeah, the important word is gatekeeping. And what's also important is that until now, internet communication has had um, severe difficulties to actually get to a level where it's becoming politically relevant. I just recently had uh, different talks with, uh, for example, editors-in-chief of uh, German newspapers and magazines and uh, also with people from the German broadcasting station ZDF, and that it really became palpable that people were irritated about the Ukraine conflict. You know? All the large media organs like Spiegel, ZDF, Süddeutsche, they seem not to be present in what can be generally called internet communication. And I don't think that this is a marketing strategy of Putin, that uh, you know, this opinion is not being reflected in the internet. The question is why? How could that happen? And then there are, of course, many theories around how this discrepancy could be uh, could have happened, and there was just you know a, an opinion poll about the measures against Russia to be taken and whether they should be stricter and harsher and uh, uh, although the large media are all in favor of that, only 9% of the German population would be in favor of these measures to become more drastic. So this is a very striking example, and I would not like to name names now, but it's also an example for influential editors-in-chief or publishers now saying, okay, we perhaps have to somehow recharter our course and give these voices a more space that have until now not been reflected in our communications in order not to drown vis-a-vis -vis a strong opinion uh, in the public, you know, that can be found in the internet but not in printed media and newspapers and not on television. So a model of bargaining is very well compatible. Then the uh, model of communities is also fully compatible. You know, the communitarian model states that there are communities being formed, that they are the foundation of democracies. There are different uh, communities. They have to negotiate with each other and bargain. So as to live democracy as a way of living, and we've got pluralistic forms of uh, communitarianism like Michael Mosso stated them and others. And Well, wonderful, you know, internet communication allows for the forming of new communities that before may have existed as a core, but that now can only assess their own strength by looking at the number of people who are members of their groups and so forth. So here again, um, good compatibility. But if we look at the first two paradigms, democracy as a democratically constituted uh, collective agent and uh, the democracy as a forum, the agora of deliberation. If you look at these two paradigms, things are rather more difficult. Let me start with the second item, the forum. A forum actually requires a kind of public that actually includes everything and everyone. And this is no longer true, not just due to the privatization of television, 
but also because of the changes of communication behaviors. You know, I mean, the numbers of hours that young and older people still spend in front of television are impressive. You know, some people ask me how I can, you know, achieve all I'm achieving. I'm saying, okay, I just have those three and a half hours that others spend in front of the television. And, but of course, people when sitting in front of the television quite frequently also are active on social media, websites, uh, follow other internet activities. And if you actually combine these times, then you end up with, you know, time frames of five to five and a half hours within which these media play a role. But I'm rather skeptical about whether these figures are actually reliable. But we could say that with a view to these two different forms of media, the functionality of the Avora of forming public opinion has diminished massively. There are no longer the large discussions where, you know, everyone who's part of the population and is at least halfway interested in politics would come up with an opinion. You know, like it was the case with the Sunday morning television show, The Frühschoppen of Werner Hofers. I'm sure you all don't remember that, and it's even, you know, I only remember it from my youth. So this is, you know, no longer around. You can say that is nostalgia. It won't ever reappear. But this, of course, leads to a problem in democracy because people are no longer informed about what's happening. You know, quite simply. Cameron, the British Prime Minister, Today wrote an article in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and it's dripping with cynicism. You really have to read that closely. I don't know whether he wrote it himself or a member of his press staff. But one of his uh, cynic remarks is that people are not really interested in the election of the Commission President, uh, but rather more in who wins the Football World Championship. That is why we have all the liberty to do what we want. We don't have to really listen to the. Um, population. I don't think that Cameron is right, but he's right in one respect. You know, the number of people who even have a basic knowledge of what is being negotiated on the political level, the number of these people has dwindled. But interestingly enough, there is the counter movement of a repoliticization of especially younger people in internet communications. But that, of course, hardly ever turns out to be politically relevant or effective. So here again, a high level of ambivalence. But this kind of particularization of communication structures did not start with the era of the Internet, but long before that. And one starting point was the privatization of television and of radio programs, of course. And that is striking and actually poses a threat to the deliberative foundation of democracy, if you think that's important. The last example, the last paradigm that I mentioned is that of the collective agent. Now, this is, of course, especially important. You know, a hopeful movement, liberal, leaning to the left or libertarian movement with some social aspects. The Arrow Theorem, formulated by Kenneth Arrow at the beginning of the 1960s, this uh, states the following, that it's not possible, it's just not possible to fulfill essential or trivial conditions of collective rationality simultaneously through a um, process of aggregation that is a collective process of decision-making. The problem of this error theorem is all the more dramatic, the more people are involved and the more alternatives are involved. The likelihood of cyclical preferences increases monotonously with the number of people who are really part of the decision-making process and the number of alternatives. And that is why liquid democracy and the mythical proof was brought about in 1963, not very elegantly, but it still led to a Nobel Prize. But there are major gaps in this mathematical proof. But liquid democracy just cannot work, full stop. It just can't work. It is logically impossible that this would work. And almost all movements ever since the 19th century, all new political movements had to experience this painfully. They, of course, did not know about the error theorem themselves, but they realized that in everyday lives, you know, every single one of these new movements 
was a, that of a grassroots democracy. And look at the Green Party and the painful process they had to go through over decades until they actually realized that grassroots democracy as such would not work. The problem is error. The problem is that if you've got a large number of people who are participating in a process of decision making with a large number of alternatives, you necessarily need up and need to end up with in a chaos, and that this chaos leads to arbitrariness in the process of decision making, or as theoreticians call it, it becomes path dependent. It's no longer depending on the preferences of those who are involved, but rather on which process of opinion forming and decision making is used. Here the arrow theorem is overlapping another theorem of Gibbard and Thetisweight that was proved in the 70s and then Alan Gibbard and the uh, economist uh, Thetisweight uh, then proved this independently from each other. But with that, these universalizations that may appear very, very appealing, but they cannot work in terms of the democratic process. But that, of course, is a severe setback for all the idealist ideas about, you know, opinion forming and decision making in democracy. Let's get back to the pirates. It was very striking that the way they described the ethics of decision making in spite of all the uh, bullying and harassment that went on, especially of course, uh, dramatic for those who have not the thick skin of a year-long politician, that uh, this all was still based on the ethics of uh, truthfulness and trust, and even that of reliability, which means, you know, there were those old cynics from the movement of 68 who said, okay, what do these kids want? They are very naive. Well, to me, it, you know, was very appealing. They wanted to really find out what everything is all about, uh, based on arguments, and then we would discuss the arguments. It's wonderful, you know, it's about the truth, not about interests. That was the buzzword, truth, not interests. Wonderful. But unfortunately, it did not work out, and it's not a coincidence or a mistake why it didn't work out. It depends on the mode of decision making that involves a large number of people and a large number of alternatives. And then, of course, there are also the minimal requirements for democracy that were all part of the concept of liquid democracy. This illusion is by no means dead. It keeps reappearing despite this newly founded party failing again. But I think we have to say goodbye to this illusion, not even the internet can actually do anything against these logical foundations. So these were a number of ethical and towards the end some political aspects uh, concerning internet communication. And I would like to now get back to uh, what I said in the beginning in order to come to a close and I would like to say a couple of philosophical things. If it were true that the way and the ways of human communication actually would re-establish the basic principles for our communication, uh, these could be reinvented with every new technological, cultural, economic change, then, indeed, it would be absolutely uh, impossible, probably, to communicate over time between languages and between cultures. You know, I mean, it actually is astonishing, and that's also interesting about learning a foreign language, that there is, you know, a limit to what can be translated from uh, one language to the other. Lots of philosophical things could be said about this, but it really has something to do with the different practice in, of how specific terms are being used. And these can no, not be translated on a one-to-one -one basis. They really have to be differentiated along the lines of the particular cultures. So there is an area of tension there, but still it's possible to communicate across cultures and across languages in spite of the problem of translation. Even across time, 
And we quite apparently are able to do that, although we have to interpret and invest some effort into texts that are 2,500 years old, but we can still read them and interpret them and understand them. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to start reading Plato or Aristotle at all. But a prerequisite for that is that, apart from all that is variant in terms of elements of communication, that there is a core that is relatively invariant. Let's call it the human condition. Part of this human condition is that people are able to actually grasp the intentions of others and that our communication behavior is best interpreted in the way that with my utterances I try to make my intentions um, understandable to who I'm talking to, along the lines of uh, conversational conventions, you know, to have basic convictions and to make certain statements or to make decisions. So this game of basing everything on reasoning is, I think, in its core, invariant across time, cultures and all the technological developments. The framework develop, um, may change, and so all of these things need to be adapted and adjusted and we have to think about how uh, the essentials of successful communication can be maintained under different uh, framework conditions, but the internet is by no means a reason to say goodbye to the human condition. On the contrary, we could say that the principles of humanism, like respecting the individual, the ability to come to your own conclusions, to have a certain distance to someone who's trying to manipulate you and that these principles have never been as current and salient as today. So that these parts of the human conditions concerning not just communication but also interaction and social cohesion are more current than ever before. And with that I would like to thank you.